This episode of Warp 5 is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join in on the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode or any other, please join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hi, this is Dayton Ward, author of a whole bunch of Star Trek novels, and you're listening to Warp 5 on Trek FM. Welcome, Boomers, to another episode of Warp 5, Trek FM's dedicated Enterprise show. I'm your host, Patrick Devlin, and I'm joined in the mess hall by the infamous Brandy Jackala. Hey, Brandy. Ooh, infamous. I like being infamous. So, I'm. Uh, how are you, Patrick? Uh, I'm not bad. I'm tired, but pretty good. <laughs> I, you? I think we're kind of all in that same boat tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to make for some giggles. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um... And as always, we are joined by Trek FM's own Brandon Shamatala. How are you, Brandon? Uh, I'm pretty darn good, and I just want to tell you that resistance to my Canadian charm is futile. <laughs> oh, I learned that months ago, almost a year ago now. <laughs> what does infamous mean? It means basically you're famous, but not necessarily for good reasons. Not, well, it, but it's not necessarily bad either. Yeah, basically, um, you're, you're notorious is basically notorious. another good word for it. Because there's like sane and insane. And so insane is like not sane. So to me, infamous would be like not famous. Yeah, well, there's also flammable and inflammable, which both mean the same thing. So explain that. Inflammable? Yeah, look would, it up. I they would think both that would mean, mean They both mean flammable. flammable. No, oh, you would think that, but you'd be wrong. You can't listen English to English is weird. You can't listen to dictionaries anymore, though. They they made figuratively. No, they made literally mean figuratively. No. Yes. I they, do not. I don't accept that. No, I don't either. But Webster's did it, so you just can't believe them anymore. I don't. I don't accept that. Just like how it used to be card sharp, not card shark. But if you say something wrong long enough, eventually it becomes right. Oh, I'm, that's awesome because you know what? I'm going to say enough times now loudly. Is you know what I could never get when I was a kid? Passers by. I always <laughs> said as passer buyers. Because <laughs> they run by and throw money at you as they go. Right. There there's multiple passers buying. I don't know. Well, it's that just you go just like it's how it's not brother in laws, it's brothers in law. I have three I have two brothers in law. I have but I've I've got two brother in laws. <laughs> See, there you go. You but know what? There's... This is so. I have none. So... I have none. <laughs> this is so double plus good. <laughs> well, that's all right. Everyone always, and it drives me insane. Since we're going to talk about English now, it drives me insane when someone says, um, uh, when they mean when they say I couldn't stand it, but they say I could. Oh, or, or I could care less. Yes. No. 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 You couldn't. That's the point. If you could yeah. care less, then you don't care lo- uh, small enough. <laughs> You know what, the Weird Al Yankovic song, Word Crimes, is like my personal anthem (laughs) because it says everything that I want to say to people every day. And he even goes off on people who say literally instead of figuratively. But now now it means the same thing, so it's fine. Here we go. I just got one last thing to say, and that is the English language will never make sense. And to try and think otherwise, you know what, resistance is futile. (laughs) Exactly. Well, and... All I'm going to say on top of that is the next time you complain about someone not learning English, remember this moment because English 
is freaking hard to learn because it doesn't obey its own rules. Yeah, Double like plus I, good. I before E except after C in words like neighbor and wife. Except for Weird. one or two words that don't obey the rules. Correct. Weird. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, it's Patrick. Terrible. So... <laughs> We should hit the Borg up, though. Let's let's get to our topic. Let's put this train back on the track. That's here. not totally off topic because we're going to be writing an episode here today. Yeah, we've got to have proper grammar and, and punctuation. Otherwise, they can't read the script. Right. So, so um, oh, but before we do that, uh, let, let's get into uh, some listeners' comments. Uh, I think we had some from this last episode, Brandon. Did we? We had one. We had one from Justin Ozer, and this is from episode 135. And he said, great interview. I learned a lot about Captain Archer's favorite sport, and I have so much respect for water polo players now. Thanks. Now, just so everybody knows, we did have a few other comments in, like, the Enterprise fan group, uh, but this is your incentive to get into the Babel conference and make comments there. We saw the comments, and I did respond to a few there. But uh, I think it was a fun interview. I think it was received very well. And I think we had a fun time doing it. Well, I had a blast. Oh, yeah. I thought it was great. I, I re-listened to it today, and I just thought, man, that was just so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned so much. And and water polo players are double hardcore. That's yes, all there is to absolutely. it. Double plus good hardcore. Double plus good hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> Grade A double plus <laughs> good hardcore. <laughs> Let's just keep Boy. putting stuff on top of that. <laughs> More adjectives necessary. Anywho. <laughs> Sorry. So the reason we're in the mess hall today is there's no place to write a good episode other than there on the ship. Uh, We can't use the command center. We can't use the command deck. So we're stuck here in the mess hall, but at least we get to have some pie. Yeah, um, because, you know, there's like that whole buffet wall there. Yes. And the drink machine. You know, I'm good with this. I'm good with this because you you need food. Okay. So today's episode we're going to write is the introduction of the Borg Queen. There was a rumor, uh, I've read online uh, a few places, that the Borg Queen was actually a human scientist who tried to, what's the word? Oh, she tried to cure the Borg. And in doing so, actually turned herself into the Borg Queen. Mm -hmm. So where should we start this story? Well, where did you hear that? Because I had heard that they were originally going to have Alice Krieg in regeneration as one of the scientists in the ice. Interesting. Uh, I forget where I read it. I do remember reading it, though. I think we got to go based off of regeneration somehow because um, if we don't, like, it, it doesn't make sense that they would know about the Borg in the 22nd century to go and cure the Borg. This right? is true. That's true, yeah. That, and how so, would they be working on a cure when the Borg were still mainly in the Delta Quadrant? Right. And the, the only reason that we had them is because of this weird temporal incursion from First Contact. Now, just so the listeners know, this is an episode that, that Patrick's wanted to do for a while here. Uh, it was his first idea that he brought to us. He says, let's write an origin story for the Borg. So I think we got to start with the end of regeneration, right? Which is that signal being sent in space. And maybe, maybe somehow it's a, a crew member. Maybe the Borg Queen was a crew member on Enterprise, and we didn't see them get assimilated or anything like that, but maybe that's something that happened. What would you think about something like that? I like picking it up right at the end of Regeneration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would work because we know that that signal's out there, but we still, at that point, and at this point in Enterprise, wouldn't know that much about the Borg's history because... All that we know was from those scientists interacting with the Borg and getting assimilated and assimilating more people and taking off in a ship. So we have to think about it with there's so much that we ourselves know about the Borg from other Star Trek series. But we have to come at it from the point of this is coming from the Enterprise timeline. So we can't use a lot of what we know in that respect. Have you guys read the the books by David Mack, the Destiny trilogy? Not yet. I'm okay, so I won't up. spoil it for you here. But for the <laughs> listeners that are screaming at their iPods right now, I do know that the Borg origin story is in there as well, because that is David Mack's 
alpha and omega for the Borg, and I do understand where the story is in there, um, but I don't want to spoil it for them who haven't read it yet, so I'll leave it as vague as that, and I, kn I know I've read them, so I know where the story is and where it comes from, but we're going to disregard that because that's just a novel, and this is a podcast, which is way closer to canon than a Absolutely. novel. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, definitely. A lot of times the books actually aren't canon, because, and even David Mack said that about the first Discovery book. But podcasts so. are canon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Even if we kill off all the characters right now, it's fine. Yep, they all get a similar. It counts. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, so, and I figure if, if they're not, if someone's not screaming at us by now, we're doing something wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of how. Yeah. If you write if an we... episode, you kind of have to accept to get, you're going to get yelled at. Yeah, if we haven't pissed anyone off yet, then I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. We'll do better. <laughs> okay, just as long as this scientist doesn't have threat ganglia, I'll be fine. Oh, God. <laughs> Useless. We're not why, talking about that. This is, that's this why is we 100 years before that. But that's why we never hear about it again, because it didn't work. <laughs> so no one even bothered talking about it. There, I fixed the cannon for everyone. <laughs> do we want to uh, Do we want to go with... Um, She's from the Arctic Circle or wherever it was. Oh yeah, let's let's have it be with the scientist well, because that means Bonita Frederici is now the Borg Queen, and that brings my heart a lot of joy. <laughs> I don't know who it is. So she was the female scientist in oh, that okay. group in the Arctic Circle. She's also married to John Billingsley. Oh, an actress. Okay, I'm like I don't yeah. know who his name is. I thought this was a scientist that you were telling me. I'm like I don't know who this is. No, 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 so. no. She was. She played a scientist on the show. Yes, yes, I did know that his wife was in this episode. That's correct, yes. Yeah. So we want to go with that then? One of the women from the Arctic Circle? Yes, I like that I, idea. I think that's the most logical and um, plot progressive. That's but hold on, I, I have a question. Um, so in the books, without spoiling it though, in the books it's the Borg origin story, but is it the Borg Queen's origin story in there? No. Right, because... They were going to specifically do the Borg Queen's origin. Right. You know what I mean? So the Borg had existed actually before the Queen got a singulary consciousness. That's yes. not actually English either, but whatever, it works. Because um, <laughs> everyone understood what I meant when I said it, even though it's wrong. <laughs> so, um, Literally. Literally, yes. We'll, we'll get that put in the dictionary tomorrow. I'm writing Webster right now. <laughs> but <laughs> it has to because it has to become canon. Mm -hmm. But... Okay, so, so we're going to go with Woman in Ice becomes Borg Queen? Sure. Okay. Now how? Now, oh, okay, I got a really interesting idea for this episode here. I don't want to, like, take the, the runaway, but what if this episode was told from her point of view through memory, like where she's like, oh, and, and like it's like a, a reflection of how she's feeling in these events and stuff. But isn't there some famous book where the narrator ends up that they're dead at the end of it and they're narrating the story after they've died? Like, what if something like this, like she's narrating it as like a subconscious portion of the Borg Queen. But by so that but by the time we get to the end of the episode, she is the Borg Queen, but she's narrating it as the human when she's dormant as the queen or something like that. Does, I don't know if I'm So maybe like, here. okay, no, wait, no. So maybe like, maybe it's her telling the story when she, kind of like if she was in Unimatrix Zero. Sure, yeah, okay. You know, like she doesn't even realize that she goes into Unimatrix Zero and then tells the story of how the Borg Queen was. And she's relaying the horrors of what she's had to do. Like, so maybe she had to, you know, she had to help inflict the Borg on some of her coworkers. Uh, and then when she got into Enterprise, I mean, we're kind of stretching you know, the storyline, and uh, we didn't really see a lot on the ship. I mean, Phlox got injected with nanoprobes, and he's immune to them, which I think is really cool. I like that myself. I think that's kind of neat. Yeah, I'm, I'm just glad it's not a Vulcan, because it's always the Vulcan who's immune to things. Well, yeah, you no want to know something funny? <laughs> if I can remember correctly, in the William Shatner's novel, The Return, that he wrote with Judith and Garfield Reed Stevens, the Borg, like, didn't want to... Uh, didn't want to assimilate Spock, who's in the book, because he had mind-melded with V'ger, and then they did this whole thing where V'ger was the Borg. I'm off on a tangent here, but this is <laughs> this is the book that like takes place after Search of Generations. But anyways. So they mm. still found a way to make the Vulcan immune. Immune. He, yeah, saying. they did. Yes. <laughs> Vulcans are always immune. Oh, man! <laughs> 
Yeah, guess what they're not immune to? Trellium. Nope. <laughs> Drug addiction. <laughs> That's perfectly logical. <laughs> so, mm. okay, so, so now we have, all right, so we're going to tell it from the point of view of the subconscious part of the queen's psyche that only comes out in Unimatrix Zero. Sure. Now I, now I know people are screaming at us, which, so we, Fantastic. you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> wager. A wager enterprise crossover. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so that would mean that Unimatrix Zero, so would it be that Unimatrix Zero existed back then, or are we doing what we hate in the last episode of Season 4, and this is all taking place in Voyager? Uh, I would say that Unimatrix Zero would have always existed, and then maybe maybe at the end, the Queen decides that Unimatrix Zero is a bad thing and wants to wipe it out, and she thinks she does wipe it out, and that's why when we get to Voyager, it's like really secretive in that it's still there, but they thought it was wiped out or something like that. Well, Which, she also, I mean, also remember when they come out of Unimatrix Zero, they don't remember that they were there. So it's easy to write that out at the end of the episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She just never knows that she visited it. Okay. Remember, yeah. Seven didn't remember until someone told her, no, you used to come here years ago. Right. Mm, and yeah. uh, no, and they don't remember good. when they come out either. So until they get that, the hack. But, uh, that shows who goes silent or whatever. And, um, but, so, all right, so then Unimatrix Zero always existed. We're not telling this from uh, 200 years, whatever, later. Good. Sure, yeah. No, I'm fine with <laughs> Unimatrix Zero having always existed. So then should the episode start in Unimatrix Zero? Sure, yeah. Okay, so we need to get a good teaser. So it could start in Unimatrix Zero, where we have this beautiful woman running around having fun with with her friends in this forest this jungle that we have and then she wakes up at the at the end of the te- it won't be a long teaser because it's enterprise at this point right and she wakes up and we see that it's the borg queen like may oh because maybe because the whole thing's told from her point of view during that opening scene maybe it's just like a, a pov shot of the camera going oh, around yeah. we don't actually see whose point of view it is oh right okay she so she's up. just running around you matrix zero Right, with people and they're having fun. You can see her hand, so you see that it's a woman who's running around or something like that. But then she opens her eyes, wakes up, and then we see it's the Borg Queen. And then, it's been a long road getting from there to here. <laughs> all those cutscenes. Yeah. You can, you can screw that up, too. You can change all those cutscenes to have Borg stuff in them. I was just going to say that. <laughs> I was just going to say that we are on the same page. You know, like it's a... It's, a, it's been a long road. Assimilate you <laughs> from there to here. <laughs> Instead of what... Is, <laughs> Shows the, the gestation of the price. Borg from their first cube and the diamond <laughs> ships. <laughs> just transwarp conduits. Floating on the ocean. <laughs> little Borg yes. spacemen. Yep. Before they were fully immune to the outside uh, elements, so they had little space helmets, Borg space helmets. Mm-hmm. HMS Entercube. Yes. <laughs> Except it would be like Enter and then like a raised three Entercube. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yes. All of this. <laughs> so apparently now we have not just ruined everything for you. We've ruined Earth as well. Yeah. <laughs> All of Earth history is now Borg. So. <laughs> well, that's what they tried to do. Yes, yes. Well, we, we, we accomplished it. Yes. <laughs> Woo! We did what they couldn't do. That's it. Roll credits. Episode's over. So. <laughs> All right. So then when we come out of the, the Borg-inspired intro, would we be seeing the Borg Queen again, or would we be seeing how the Borg Queen came to be? I'm I'm sorry, but I just got an even epic ending to this. I was just sitting here, and I just had a vision of an epic ending and how we could end this. Okay, don't say it yet. Don't say it yet. Write well, it down. We Write might it have down. to. We might have to pull a Star Trek Discovery and build from the ending, and then nothing would work. Okay, but... everybody hit mute. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> no. Skip it's forward. Not spoiling anything. Skip forward what and then if come back. This entire story then is told. In the fraction of a second before she dies, and so the last shot we see is that shot from first contact. When the oh. cards break in her spine. Yeah. Yes. So we do pull an episode, a season four, last episode. 
I don't know, maybe. Cool, we, now we pissed everyone off, so it's perfect. I like it. Yes, everyone's fully full of rage. Yes. Fully full of rage? Wow. Fully of rage. No, that no I'm not. Either. I'm actually, I think that'd be a great ending if this ended up being like a, you know, like a flash point of death for her right before she dies, reflecting on how she became the queen. And that would be like um, like our version of your life flashing before your eyes. Yeah. Except well, yeah. hers happens in a millisecond in her brain. Well, and that's what would happen with, you know, the cybernetic processing power that the Borg have. It would literally be, and I mean that literally, it would yeah. literally be a millisecond because of how quickly their brains process. The fact that she even bothers to speak, you know, must be just excruciating for her because it's not an effective way to communicate. Okay, so so all right, so now now we have to now we have to pull a discovery and work forward, right? <laughs> so, okay, so we've got we got the intro to the episode and the exit. So the intro is her in Unimatrix Zero, and then uh, she wakes up, and the end of the episode is when she dies in First Contact, and so the rest of it is kind of the story in between. So she's the scientist. She's she's assimilated on Earth, right, and then. Perhaps we see it from her point of view, the assimilation process, and she's the one who has to assimilate her, her, the other people. And just before the ship is blown up, I guess, maybe a, maybe a small chunk of it has escaped or something, and she's able to generate a transwarp hub drive or whatever. I can't remember my terms for this. And, like, warp back to the Delta Quadrant or whatever. So, a transwarp conduit. Thank you. There we go. Transwarp yeah. conduit. She can, like, open one up and she gets away. And because it's early enough and because of the time differential, right, she, that's the reason why maybe she's the origin of the Borg by going to the Delta Quadrant where the signal was sent to. And then she starts assimilating people there. And that could be, like, the next chunk of the the story is her escaping the Enterprise and then going to the Delta Quadrant, and the next chunk is her in the Delta Quadrant starting to assimilate some planets. Okay, what if we... That's... Uh, okay. So I was thinking more along the lines of that the Borg Queen actually... Because um, we started talking about her being in um, Unimatrix Zero, right? So the Borg come, they assimilate her, she she ends up going into Unimatrix Zero. We're watching this from her point of view from there. What if her becoming the Queen was always her plan to get rid of the Borg... And then when she became the queen, she got power hungry and didn't want to destroy the Borg. What if she created Unimatrix Zero? Dun, dun, dun. You realize, you realize, of course, that this is all paradoxical. Of course it is. They, they, they went back in time to create something that was already created. Yeah. So right. she... <laughs> well, no, My but... brain just broke. I'm okay. I'm okay. Well, maybe she doesn't create the Borg itself. We I mean... No, but she creates herself. Well, no, they and... create her. Yeah, well, I mean, they create her, but at, at the same point, without her sending them back in time, so she creates herself. Right, Because herself in the future ha knows that she has to go back in time in order for those Borg to be frozen in the Antarctic, to be revived by her, and turn her into a Borg. Yes. I like that. That that that's so Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but it could happen the first time without her in interference. But then she just has to keep making sure it happens each time. See, that's why I don't believe time travel is possible. Myself is because I, you know, for everybody's like, oh, the circle, like it, at, at some point, something has to start something. There has to be that linear progression. But I'm not going to get into a time travel debate. No. You know, let's, we, let's we please can do, not do that. We can yeah, do that on another that. episode. Yeah. So. <laughs> Debate time travel. Write that one down. Right. So yeah. So okay. So so she she is the Borg Queen. She sends them back in time to to create herself, who's the scientist on Earth. Um, she escapes in a piece of debris when the Enterprise blows up that ship. That goes to the Delta Quadrant, and then that's when she she starts to create the Borg. Then and build them up by assimilation and stuff, right? Okay, so we pick up right after the intro. We pick up with her being assimilated and hitting the transwarp, right? Being assimilated, and then maybe a little bit of time we spend on that ship. Okay, right before it gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, like the, the her being in Unimatrix Zero doesn't necessarily chronologically in the episode doesn't have to be the first thing that occurs. It's just to get us in the episode, like in the episode Impulse. It wakes up. The episode starts with T'Pol screaming, 
Right, and then that's really we, we go back much later. Yeah, a couple of days earlier, whatever it was. But it's you just know what? A... I really hate that starting with this and then it goes to twenty four hours earlier. I'm like, oh lord, stop doing that. I don't like that, that either. I normally just don't. But stop doing that. I think Everybody it works. does it. Yeah, but I think it, it works for this episode. It and works in this case because we are fiddling with easy. time and reality. <laughs> And everyone does it because it's easy. Yeah, but in reality, <laughs> at the end, at the end of all this, we're gonna all of this took place at one moment. So it doesn't matter where we stick it's the memories true. into the it's episode, true. because none of that is actually taking place while we're watching it anyway. Right. Yeah, yes. Okay. Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. Woo! Yes. We're good at that on the show. Mm-hmm. So okay. So then, all right. So you see, others get assimilated. Um, maybe we get a couple scenes where they actually show like more of the assimilation process itself. Uh, and then she hits the transwarp conduit and goes to the Delta Quadrant. Sure. And what happens next? So she starts She starts with her first assimilating of a planet. But we could see at this point that maybe she's like sad and doesn't want to do it, but the Borg technology is overtaking her and giving her no choice. Almost like a Locutus where, you know, we see that tear in Picard's eye. Well, see, and that's the thing. That's why Locutus was special. And that's why, you know, retconning the whole Locutus thing and how that's why she gave him a name instead of him just being another mindless drone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Right, but something had to make her special to become queen too, right? So what is it? What is it about her that made it so that she was able to become the queen and not just another drone? Because presumably up until that point, you only have drones. Right. So my idea is this, is that, okay, so the Borg Queen sends everybody back in time. Then then they get frozen. They create her. But she's the only one to survive and go to the Delta Quadrant. When she gets to the Delta Quadrant, there are no Borg because she creates the Borg. And because she creates them, she's the queen. Right? Yeah, so the temporal she would paradox be... is her. She's the first one to create the Borg, okay. but she creates herself. Yeah, because she would be the one creating the hive mind, and therefore she'd be top dog. Right, okay. So yeah. the, the paradox itself is what's special about her. Right. Yeah. That gives her the ability to become queen. What mm-hmm. if we, And then there you go. What if we just name this episode Paradox? I, don't know. <gasps> I like it. Can we do that? <laughs> Paradoxical. <laughs> but yeah. I like it. Um. Okay. Well, oh, that really poo poos my whole. She wanted to destroy them. That's why she became the queen thing. Okay, so now where do we go from here? So now she goes, and now we start seeing her. She she goes to a, a planet, and she starts to create more Borg. <gasps> okay. Uh oh, he's got. Apparently, something. Brandon he's has the something. idea. It's what you just said, where you're like, where she wanted to destroy the Borg, and that's why she did it. Well, what if, no, and that's why we get that term, resistance is futile, is that she's like, she's got this inner monologue fighting herself. And at some point she says, I can't resist this anymore, I can't, I don't want to do this. Like, we see her kill one person and make them a Borg, another one she's crying, and then she's like, I can't handle this, I can't resist this anymore, resistance is futile. And that could be like the first time that the Borg say that. Okay, because so basically we've narrowed the Borg down to being drug addicts. <laughs> Not drug addicts. No. <laughs> like, Patrick. I don't want to do it. The bang. human part of this woman is now in the sunken place, okay? She can only view what's going on, but she can't control it anymore. That's a get out reference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate you jumping in with that. I've seen okay. Get Out. <laughs> I, I have. I haven't yet. Okay. Um, okay. So, so, so not only is she the queen, not only does she create herself, she also creates the resistance is futile in a, in a, a monologue in her own head when she's starting to to bring about new Borg. Why not? Cool. No, I like it. I'm just trying to get okay, to the points here. <laughs> um, and then. After that, now now she's she's uh, assimilated. I was about to say converted, but she's assimilated a couple planets. So now she starts having a force, right? An actual force. And the little one man ship that she took back to the Delta Quadrant, she's actually built into spheres and cubes and diamonds and baseball hats and whatever else she wanted to fly around <laughs> the universe with. So, <laughs> whatever they came up with in those planets. Um, why those shapes? Cause, Perfection, because they're yeah. you know like she's. You know, but circles don't make sense. 
Yeah, well, they don't need to make sense because they're a sphere and you don't have to have a particular shape to exist in space and fly in space. But cube makes sense because it's extremely utilitarian. Yeah. You can fit the most amount of drones into a cube. Yeah, well, maybe she, maybe that's some of her human... Artistic side? Artistic side, yeah. She cool. was a bowler. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. Really? Maybe she just really liked skee-ball. Yeah, you well, don't know. May- <laughs> who knows? Maybe she also liked water polo. <laughs> who knows? Hey, according to Last Full Measure, Archer was an actual water polo player, and that's why he's so obsessed with it. Yes, yes. Measure. 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 Measure? Measure. <laughs> Measure? <laughs> Measure. Right. So, Measure. So, tune in, <laughs> guys, tune in next week for our English class. Um, with, for people who've been listening for a long time, uh, we used to have a math class that went on here every time I guessed on this show. <laughs> Apparently, that's become English. I'm really good at English. I, I'm okay, not. I'm, I'm going to take a step back because I got one more thing that I would like to see in the episode, but I don't want to dominate the writing of this episode. I'm gonna, I'll take a step back because I have one more thing that I think we need to see in this episode that would be wonderful. Okay, All right. so. so now now, I think we should see the start of the war with species, what is their number? Anyone remember? Four something. Eight, four, seven, two. Eight, eight four, four, seven, seven two. two. I yes. knew there was a four in there. Mm. So but now, that's, so okay, now that's after first contact, though. Yeah. Right? That's in the Voyager quadrant, well, or Delta quadrant. But we're in the one. Delta quadrant, right? Yeah, we're right, in the but, Delta quadrant, but we're not that far in the future yet. Right, I got the impression that the war with 8472 is, like, just a recent thing. Like, well, it just I, recently happened. Honestly, I'm not that versed in um, Voyager, so. Yeah. Okay, well, I can give you my idea if you want from, like, one other thing that I'd like to see in the episode. Because we never got the explanation of it. And this is the kind of thing that they do in episodes like this. I'd like to see when Guinan's planet gets taken over by the Borg. I think that'd be a great thing to see. And that would, could be, like, maybe the last climax of the episode or something like that. Where they take over the planet Aloria. Aloria? Alorian? Aloria? Alorian. Oh so. Okay, so that would be. So that, that planet would be the last scene before we cut back. And maybe the camera panning out from her eye, you know, on that last moment before she dies. Yeah, I think so. So what else yeah. can we stuff in here? <laughs> we need something between the taking over all the planets to that planet. We need something in there. And we have no B plot so far, so. I don't think we need one. So, like, so the introduction is maybe, like, a, she's in Unimatrix Zero, and that's how it starts. So this is what we got so far. And then the next, the first act is her getting assimilated and assimilating some of her, her crewmates on the on the uh, ICE mission, uh, leaving, and then just before they get destroyed, she gets sent off to the Delta Quadrant. She escapes and goes to the Delta Quadrant. Act 2 is her coming across her first planet and deciding to start assimilating, but she's having trouble. You know, she's she doesn't want to do it. She assimilates one. She assimilates a second. Then she realizes she can't she can't resist it. She resistance is futile. She says that. Right. Okay, so this is the moment where Unimatrix Zero gets created. Because she sure. feels bad about Ooh. taking away their for lack of a better word, humanity, she creates that as a place where they can go to still be individuals. I like that, actually. Yeah. Her regret over having to do this created Unimatrix Zero, and then we could get a, the scene that we saw at the beginning of the episode. Right, maybe from a different point of view, where we actually see her interacting, more of actually her interacting. Right, so then Act 3 could be like, you know, it's a little bit down the line, but it's it's a it's a, a full act that's within Unimatrix Zero, with the Queen. So we could see her a- interacting with other Borg within Unimatrix Zero. Then Act Four would be the final act, which would be taking over Guinan's planet. Right, and then and then the, the episode death. ends. Right, right on the death. Yeah, I like that episode. Yeah. Let's write this as a book. David Mack, where are you? <laughs> Let's get on this. We, we could probably flush it out with one more act. I think most TV has about five acts. Is that about right? Yeah, Sounds they're about, about right. Act five. 
But I don't know. Like, maybe we could flush it out somehow. But that's basically... I don't know. I think that's a pretty good no, that's, structure I, for an episode. Yeah, I think, like, along with the Unimatrix Zero, maybe at first they remember when they come out, but then the Borg implants themselves to protect against people not wanting to be Borg um, evolve to, to take those memories away. So you only remember them when you're in. Then little by little, they that evolves out of the... Only the original Borg would have that. And that's why they're, like, two on this ship and two on that ship when we get to that part. You know, because it was only those first, let's say, three or four planets she assimilated that she gave that ability to, to go to Unimatrix Zero. Okay. Um, and then it would have to be unlocked in you somehow, you know. And that just naturally progresses into... A, um, I mean, this doesn't have happen in our episode, but that those people naturally become the resistance because they remember their individuality. It's like an app. You become a board for free, but then you have to pay credits <laughs> to get into the Unimatrix Zero. Right, right. right. $1.99. Those, those in-app purchases, they get yeah. you every time. But the commercials go away if you buy them, so it's worth it. Okay. Resistance is futile. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, I just had the most bizarre thought. Okay. What if, as a final stinger, after we see Picard killing the board queen, that the very, very final, final scene, right before the credits start, is the Voyager Borg Queen waking up. See, now, I like it, but the difference with that is that Susanna Thompson played the Borg Queen in Voyager twice, I think it was, and then mm -hmm. Alice Krieg came again, and I really wish they didn't bring Alice Krieg back for the end game. I like Alice Krieg, but it just it messes with my head that this is supposed to be the same one, even though she died, it, yada, yada, yada. So, in my head canon, Susanna Thompson is the Borg Queen in Endgame as well, but, you know. That's fine, because That's I love for... Susanna Thompson. I love Alice Craig as well, don't get me wrong, but I really yeah. loved Susanna Thompson as the Borg Queen. Yeah. And she was also in uh, D Space Nine, hey? Yeah, she was, eh? She was, uh, she was a trill. Yeah, she was the trill that Jadzia Dax kissed. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd kiss Susanna Thompson. Well, Not so in a romantic I. way, but, you know, she's. I just really like her. <laughs> I'm just, just going to shut up. <laughs> Rails off. Rails off. Okay, so yeah, so then she wakes up as Susanna Thompson. We get Susanna Thompson guesting in this episode as well. I'm okay yeah, with that. Because it's obvious. I mean, they've made it clear in Voyager that there is more than one Borg queen and that the memories would be shared throughout the Borg because she was the nexus of the hive mind. So Right. Okay, so now I'm not, like I said, I, I've watched Voyager, but I, that's not my, you know, that's not my favorite. Um... When they make that clear, there's more than one Borg Queen over time, or they so there's only one at a time, though, right? See, I got the impression watching Voyager that it was supposed to be the same Borg Queen. That's what I thought. So that's the impression that because I got. Everything I read Voyager. also just said that uh, they went to, oh, who was the first one? The first one Alice was... Alice Krieg? That was Alice the first Krieg Voyager, Alice Krieg was the first right? Borg Queen in First Contact, and right. then Susanna Thompson was in two... Uh, I, th I think it was it was Dark Frontier and Unimatrix Zero yes. that sh that Susanna Thompson showed up, and then Alice Creed came back for Endgame. Yeah, and the only re what I from everything I've read, it was only because when when they did the movie, you know, one was there, and then she wasn't available, so they switched, yes. and then that's right, she became unavailable for the last episode, so they just switched back. Right, it, you know, it was it wasn't a conscious thing; it was just like, uh oh, we need a character. Right. I was just thinking, so if we wanted to flush out that one more act, if we did, the only other logical storyline that we would need to see another point of view would be the Dark Frontier timeline with, with Seven of Nine and her parents. Because that's the other episode that has the Borg Queen in it, right? And that would tie, like, everything together throughout Star Trek continuity for the Borg Queen. And we could just see a little bit of how the Borg Queen is the one who saved Seven or something like that, right? As a child. Because there is that bond between Seven and the Borg Queen. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. The Borg Queen does say that she allowed Seven of Nine to leave the Collective. Right. Not that she, not that they rescued her, but that she allowed it. Right, right. Yeah. yeah I don't know. I, I kind of always felt they wanted to tell you that eventually that the, the Borg Queen was her mother, but... You no, know, because mm. we, we saw in Dark Frontier that she had her parents no i know they, they were they went they were research right that's what they were researchers doing. yeah and then they were taken but uh but if we were just sending people back in time to create people that could be easily fixed too <laughs> don't mess it up too much <laughs> <laughs> but, 
I like this. I don't know. I like. I think this is a really interesting episode. I don't know. This is good. Yeah. So see, we should get to write season five, at least one episode. We totally should. And who cares if this contradicts stuff that's on Memory Alpha? I don't care. I I purposely didn't even look today. <laughs> I mean, there's there's things in episode fifteen of Star Trek Discovery that contradict stuff that was in episode fourteen of Discovery. Yeah, that's it's just it's part of part and parcel of Star Trek, man. Part and so, parcel of Star Trek. It's just, if you don't like what we're doing, well then we're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's loving it, and this is their favorite episode. And then you know, and yeah, and then someone else is yelling at them that they don't know what they're talking about. Yes, so, exactly. that's that's and how they, we do it. And those two probably live together. Mm -hmm. So they're either uh, related by family or by marriage. Yep, yep. <laughs> they're they're yelling at each other over our podcast as we speak. Yep. Okay, so do we want to call this episode paradox, or resistance, or futile? We could do. They could be one of the three, really. Like. Paradox, because it is a temporal paradox, and then resistance or futile, because she's the one who invents the term resistance is futile. Hmm. Or, it, no, there's an episode called Resistance already in Voyager, yeah. I think. But, I mean, that doesn't matter, because we had Nemesis and First Contact were episodes and movies. So. Yeah, man, I like the idea of paradox, so. Sure. I do, yeah, too. let's go with that. Let's go with paradox as the title. So. Yes, it, uh... it, it covers the basic mcguffin of why this is happening so yeah, yeah. i think this Excellent. would be like an episode five of the season sure seems like a good place for a throwaway episode oh. <laughs> oh, man <laughs> come on we've done some good work here it, but it has no long-standing effect on enterprise no it doesn't it doesn't we're looking for a third host of the show. Patrick's going to be leaving. So. <laughs> nice working with you guys. Thank you. Yeah, well, it was all fun and games. Until... Hey, I, I must now hold the record for being thrown off this show. So <laughs> at least there's that. I think we got a great episode. So, yeah, we got the – we could start off with Hugh Matrix Zero. Uh, and then her eyes open and we see it's the board queen. And then it goes to the theme song. And then we got the the first act is – leaving Earth, getting assimilated, and the ship getting destroyed by Enterprise, and she evacuates to the Delta Quadrant. Act 2 is her first assimilation. She doesn't like doing it. She comes up with the term resistance is futile because she, she can't resist this force that's within her. Um, act 3 is uh, in Unimatrix Zero because she invented it as a way to pull herself out of being the Borg Queen. Or at least the guilt uh, of it. Yeah. Act 4 could be the destruction of Guinan's homeworld. Act 5 could be introducing some aspect of how she's got this connection to Seven, by that she's brought Seven into the collective herself. And then she dies, and then we, we pull out of her eye, and we see her die in first contact. And then we fade to black, and just when you think the credits are going to come up, her eye opens up, and it's Susanna Thompson from Voyager. Perfect. In. Yes. Paradox. Mm -hmm. And we used almost no Enterprise characters. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yes, but all of these events got going because of Enterprise, really. Yes. So Enterprise created the Borg. Yep. There we go. Sure. Through a paradox. Let's go with that. I love it. Excellent. Right on. They didn't they didn't specifically. I mean the show created the Borg, but the Enterprise crew did not. We could write that episode another time. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it all started happening on that Antarctic station. Gosh. Okay. When the two ships flew together and they weren't really there because they cheated and then they split, <laughs> the other ship was actually in the future making the Borg go back in time to create the Borg. <laughs> Cold open for the next week. Sweet. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Let's write episode this is, six. <laughs> this is why we have a writer's room with the three of us. I love it. <laughs> so, whew, that got out of control quick. <laughs> well, it's the three of us. What did you expect? Yeah, true. <laughs> all right. So I think that's about all for the episode, right? I mean, yeah. there's nothing yeah. really else to add. That seems like a perfect episode of Enterprise anyway. It, it kind of has everything you expect to see in the way an Enterprise episode would have been written in the first place. It's been fun talking about the Borg Queen today, but this isn't the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. 
previously on Trek.fm, The Ready Room. I'd like to see a starship where the chief medical officer is a Tellarite oh. <laughs> and see his bedside manner. I'll see, I'll see your your crappy Lewis Zimmerman hologram <laughs> right. amalgamation and raise you a Tellarite doctor. Yeah. Uh-huh. The 602 Club. This is such an incredible beachhead in terms of what they do with what we've come to expect now with, like, the beginning of Guardians of the Galaxy or resurrecting Peter Cushing. Warp 5. We share about 50% of our DNA with a banana, so I think we're a bit yeah. closer to, to <laughs> reptiles um, than 50%, but still. No, you're, I, yeah, I, so what I you're saying is it's possible to have an intelligent banana. Um, I'm not saying that. I'm just and saying I'm 50% that. 50% banana. To the journey! Bullions don't have a lot of hair. That we know of. So, I mean, we've never seen a shirtless bullion, have we? Not that I can recall, unless it would be in sick bay or something like that, but I can't recall an incident of a shirtless bully. <laughs> How do you know that they're not hairy chested? I kind of love the idea that, like, from the neck down, they're covered in hair, but they're bald on top. <laughs> and that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. And you'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, please be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And pretty please, with sugar on top, would you leave us a star rating and written review? The written review is really important. It helps people find the show. If you're not an Apple user, we will cradle you anyway into our bosom. And you can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can scream, you can scream, you can scream, just scream your little hearts out. You can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the search field on Facebook. It should come right up. And once you get there, you'll never re leave because resistance is futile. <laughs> if you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Warp 5. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. Brandy. Where can people find you when you're not crying your little heart out because you don't want to assimilate people? Oh, and I, that would totally be me, too. That would be me. <laughs> That's exactly how I would react to that. Well, you can find me in the Babel Conference, of course. Uh, I won't be assimilating anyone, I promise. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at BrandyWine12. Brandy is with an I. The 12 is a number. And I also do a podcast with my husband called The Dark Corner Podcast, which you can find on strangeanddeadly.com. And we talk about things from a darker point of view. And when new episodes of Discovery are running, I co-host Live from the Edge with Bruce Gibson. But that won't be back for a while. But when it is, look out world. Here we come. Patrick, where can people find you when your life is not flashing before your eyes before Captain Picard snaps your spine? <laughs> so, so if I'm not dying at the moment, they can find me at the uh, Babel Conference. I pop my head in and out of there. And they can find me on Twitter at Magic Drop 5. Uh, that's one word. Uh, five is a number. I'm not nearly as busy as the rest of you. So that's pretty much the only places you can catch me. So, Brandon, where can people find you when you're not going back in time to make sure your parents have you? <laughs> So much better than mine. <laughs> um, you, you, you can find me on the Fable Conference every once in a while, poking my head up. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brandon Matella. Uh, you can find me here on the network with The Edge, which is our Star Trek Discovery podcast. And you can find me over on the Fandom Podcast Network with a show called Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast, where we've just finished up our last silent film by hitchcock oh it's been a long run of silence. we're very happy to be done that yeah i understand <laughs> i do
If you'd like to help us keep all your shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron on, of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. Available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details on patreon.com slash trekfm. And at this time, we would like to thank very much our associate producers of the show and of the network as well. We've got some wonderful, wonderful people who have graciously decided to donate to Trek FM, and we couldn't thank them possibly enough, so we will try, even though resistance is futile, and I don't know, I can't even make that a good board thing, I'm sorry. Uh, we appreciate everything you can do. You guys are in us like nanites. Mm -hmm. We'd like to thank Norman C. Lau, Borg 7 of 12, Floyd Dorsey, Borg 3 of 2, Mike Morrison... <laughs> Borg Pi R squared. Tim, <laughs> Tim Cooper. Uh, Borg 8 of 18,382. Justin Ozer. Borg 1 of 1. Mark Flessa. Borg 18 of 4. And Joe Saltzman. Pirate Borg extraordinaire. 18 of 4. That's awesome. Should we tell them what's coming up on the next couple episodes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Ex excellent. Next week, we're doing our next movie night episode, and we're going to be covering The Day the Earth Stood Still, the original Woo! classic. And the week after that, we're going to be doing our Essential Enterprise Season 2. I know that it's been a while since we've covered Season 1. That was way back in December that we did that. I but, remember uh, I was there. Yeah, we're finally going to get to Season 2 of that. And then the episode after that is going to be our first part of our Season 4 retrospective. So if you guys want to watch ahead of time, watch The Day the Earth Stood Still, and then you can watch Stormfront Parts 1 and 2 and Home. We're only going to be covering three episodes in that podcast, but those are the next couple that we've got coming along. Yeah. Thank you again for joining us on Warp 5, and remember, keep calm and boom on. <laughs>